give God a hand clap of praise. All right. Now, I also need to reiterate what was on the screen, and, and that is that um, save for this Thursday's, after this Thursday's uh, Soul Food Thursday, and I know I missed the last one. Um, I'm still trying to get my last end of the year schoolwork turned in, so please be patient with me. I, I can't, I really want to be at all these all these different things, but I, I gotta, I gotta stay in school, amen. So um, after this Thursday, we are going to uh, be Payne Chapel Academy will close down for the summer, like the public schools. Uh, we're going to take July and August off. Everybody, recharge and refresh your battery, and be ready to get back in Bible study in the month of September. Church, say Amen. So if you really, really really going to miss Bible study, make sure you come for Soul Food Thursday. I, I promise you I will be there for that. I'm not going to, there's not going to be an accident on the highway that's going to keep me from getting here for a Soul Food Thursday, but that is after that. Senior program will also be closed for the month of July and August as well, so that will be our official send-off into the summer, and then hopefully I'll be done with all my schoolwork and we can just relax for a little while. Amen. And um, I will, I'm going to try to get my preaching schedule. I, for whatever reason, um, I have a problem saying no to people. And um, so I'm going to be preaching pretty much all over the country this summer. But I will be in the, I will, I've scheduled all my preaching engagements so that I can be back here on Sunday morning. So there will only be um, only two Sundays that I'm not in the pulpit this summer. I'll tell you when they are after they pass. So anyway, um, but right now I want you to do this favor for me. I want you to uh, turn to your neighbor and look at your neighbor, smile at your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, you are in the right place this morning. All right, I, you sound good, you look good doing that. I want you to share that good news with somebody else uh, someone in front of you, behind you, touch hands with them, smile at them, love on them, and say, neighbor, oh, neighbor, you are in the right place this morning. If you don't mind, let's just move around the room briefly, uh, give a handshake or hug to somebody, welcome them, and say that they're in the right place this morning. I really love you. I really love you. Because you first love me. Speed it up a little bit. I really love you. Yes, I do. Sing with me. I really love you. Oh, yes, I do. I really love you. Because you, because you first love me. I really love you, yes I do. I really love, I really love you. I really love you. Because, because you first love me. I really love you, yes I do. How can you love me, knowing all the things I've done? And then you show me when you gave your only son. I really love you. I really love you. Yes, I do. How can you love? How can you love me? Knowing all the things I've done. And then you show me when you gave your only son. I really love you. I really love you. Yes, I do. How can you love? How can you love me? Knowing all the things I've done. And then you show me. And then you show me. When you gave your only son. I really love you. I really love you. Yes, I do. You are the air. You are the air I breathe. You are the song I Because you first love me, 
church say amen. Anybody really love the Lord in here? Oh, don't, don't fool me now. I said anybody really love the Lord? One of the songwriters said, you don't know what he's done for me. Gave me the victory. I love him. I love him. I really love, I'm trying to figure out anybody really love him. I, I was, I want to hear you shout glory in here. I said if you love him, you ought to shout hallelujah. hallelujah. If you really love him and you're grateful, you ought to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Oh, amen. Now, now, I'm, I omitted one announcement. Um, on August 1st, we're planning a family trip. Family trip. And so... With that family trip, we're going to go out of town because it's the summertime, and that's what you do when you got your family. You don't take a trip in town, you take a trip out of town. And we're planning to go on this family field trip August 1st. Um, it's open to everybody, not just members of the Payne Chapel, but members of our friends and family we want to um, bring and invite them along. Uh, August 1st, we are going to head to Orlando um, for the World Banquet at the Medieval Times in Orlando, Florida. The, uh, the charge is a nominal one. Uh, we're asking adults to pay $90 and children 4 to, to 12, a price of $62. Now, um, it could be pricey depending on how many kids you have, but that's why we're telling you now so you can, you know, get them outside this summer, wash some cars with them, all that kind of a thing probably pay for all y'all to go. Uh, so either way, however you want to do it, um, I want you to put that on your calendar for us to go and enjoy some medieval times together. Amen? Uh, the, 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 if you're interested, complete and return one of these forms to Arby Bankhead, Sister Camille Bunch, um, and their telephone number should be printed on, on, on these cards. Now let's give another hand to this choir who's been singing so excellently for us this morning. Have another selection from them and then we'll hear words from the Lord. Hallelujah. You know my name. So how you walk with me. friends, you know my name, 
walk with me. Go how you walk with me. Go how you talk. Go how you talk with me. Thank you for communion, Lord. Go how you tell me that I am your own, that I am your own. Now sing it to the Father and say, you know, you know my name. He knows your name. You know my name. It is sketched upon his heart, you know. You know my name. Yeah, yeah, you know. You know my name. Go how you walk. Go how you walk with me. Go how you talk with us, Lord. Go how you talk with me. Thank you for communion. Go oh, how you tell me that I am, that I am your own. And oh, how you walk with me. And oh, how you walk with me. I'm never alone, no. And oh, how you talk with me. You keep on keeping on. Know how you tell me that I am your own, that I am your own. Let's sing that one more time. And know how you walk, and know how you walk with me. Oh, how you talk, yes. And know how you talk with me. Hallelujah. Oh. And oh, how you tell me that I am your own, that I am your own. No fire can burn me. No fire can burn me. No battle can turn me. No mountain can stop me. Because you are my head. And I'm walking in your victory, because your power is within me. No giant can defeat me, because you are my head. No fire, no fire can burn me. No battle can turn me. No mountain can stop me, because you are my head. And I'm walking. In your victory, because your power is within me. No giant can defeat me, because you are my head. You hold 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 my head. You know my name. He knows. Oh, how you walk with me, unison say, and oh, how you walk with me, oh, how you talk with me, and oh, how you talk with me, oh, how you tell, and oh, how you tell me, I am your own, and I am pray. God, I ask that you would auto-correct my sermon this morning. That you would take out what you don't want and add to it what you need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, your prayerful
attention is called to the book of Daniel, the third chapter, beginning at verse 13. Daniel, third chapter, uh, beginning at verse 13. When you have it, say amen. Still looking, say hold on. No, you're not going to make it. You know what to do. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought so that they, that these men, uh, will be standing before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve any of my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up. Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every other kind of music, you should fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning fiery furnace and who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king O Nebuchadnezzar we have no need to answer you in this matter if this be so our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand O king but if not, be it known to you, king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, if you've been following along in Bible study up to this point, um, and, or you've been traveling uh, with the, with the uh, preaching engagement that I've had, you're going to notice some nuances to this sermon, some things I've preached before, some things I've taught before, but I'm kind of doing a, uh, a, a, a blending sort of a thing for this, um, for the purpose of this service. <clears throat> there was a movie that came out a little while ago, um, I'm not sure exactly what year it was released, but it was a very popular film about the life and time of Mrs. Catherine Goldberg Johnson. Um, she, you remember her because she was the mathematician who worked on the Apollo 11 uh, flight that sent John Glenn into orbit around the Earth. Um, she um, was a phenomenal sister, and by all accounts, because of the genius that she displayed in geometrical uh, calculations, she is considered one of the foremost probably one of the most intelligent people, not man, not woman, but one of the most intelligent people who has ever walked this earth. And she's still alive. Um, though the movie almost set to memorialize her, she is uh, uh, a, a sprightly, I want to say 101, 100 years old, something to that degree. But she doesn't seem to be leaving here anytime soon. We bless God for it because she is a seminal example of what it means to not just uh, be intelligent, but to be, in, excuse me, but to have courage to match your intelligence. And so Catherine Goebel Johnson is immortalized in this film beside Mary Jackson and Dorothy Vaughn as they are computers, uh, human computers, who have been segregated at the Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. Um, they are working with NASA, trying to uh, pitch trajectories and trying to calculate distances so that the astronomers, excuse me, the uh, astronauts are able to successfully win the space race. Because during 1961, we were in competition with Russia in the space race, and it was a, a race to see who could get beyond the Earth's atmosphere first, who would be able to set foot on the moon, and who, in fact, would win this race because as we know now, as we probably did not know then, the implications of winning the space race were going to mean who was in charge of satellites, who was 
going to be able to send signals faster than anyone else, who was able to download information. If we did not win the space race, y'all probably be paying more for your Sprint, your AT&T, and all them other kind of things that you have. If it wasn't for us winning the space race, you know, telling how much you'd be spending for your cable and your direct TVs and all these kinds of things. But because of these women who I described, uh, Mary Jackson, Dorothy Vaughn, Catherine Global Johnson, these women helped propel us further in, out in the space race beyond our opponents because of uh, the special skills that they have. Now, in the movie Hidden Figures, there was very unique uh, circumstances because while this was going on, these women were gifted women, but they were also under segregation. And so we noticed they had challenges that with the restroom where they, or where they held the, comp the human computers was all the way on the other side of the, of the field, of the, of the building uh, at Langley. And these women had to walk on, well, when Catherine Gopher Johnson was elevated in position, and she was moved from the human computer to being on the research team for the space task group, she had to walk almost half a mile to use the restroom every day. People belittled her intelligence, even when she met the man of her dreams in the movie. Y'all, I know y'all, y'all seen the movie? Okay, I was just making sure, because y'all giving me faces like y'all hadn't seen this film before. But y'all remember when the Lieutenant Colonel, Jim Johnson, uh, met uh, his soon-to-be one-day wife. Uh, even he belittled her ability to calculate complex math formulas, thinking that women weren't that smart. And it almost messed that thing up, so he spent an additional period of time trying to court the lady to get her back on the good side. Y'all, come on now, y'all understand what I'm trying to say. These women were not thought of based on their ability. They were thought of based on preconceived notions on who they were, on how people perceived black women at that time, how little people thought of the abilities that these black women had. But these women were far more than what their appearance and what social standards were. They were gifted. Matter of fact, they weren't just gifted. They were chosen for a specific time like this because without them, as I once said, NASA could not achieve what it once did. John Glenn made the bold statement to say that if Catherine Goble Johnson does not provide my calculations, then I will not get on your aircraft or, or attempt to orbit the Earth because it was a tight window to exit the Earth's atmosphere, but it was an even tighter window to get back in it. And because of her heroism because of her intellect and because of her courage. She was the hidden figure that changed history for not just the United States, but the world. All of us have got some hidden figures in our lives. It may not be specific to Catherine Goble Johnson, but all of us have somebody who was able to do something for us at a time when nobody else could do it. At a time when nobody else was willing and nobody else had the ability, somebody stood in the gap for us and was a hidden figure in our lives. They didn't get a whole lot of credit. They may have been like Katherine Johnson, had to wait 50 years for Obama to come give her the National Medal of Freedom. But for whatever reason, or a mother or another, there was somebody in our lives who didn't ask for a lot of reward, didn't ask for no money back, didn't ask for a round of applause, didn't ask for their name to be put on the program. But they just did something in our lives because they knew it was first the right thing to do, but it was also a blessing. It would be a blessing for us. How many of you can think back to your family members or your, 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 your grandmothers or aunts or play cousins and people who have imparted some historical moments in your lives that you rarely even think about on days like this. Um, many of us uh, lives have been filled with hidden figures, people that we probably couldn't remember their faces if we tried, but they were there in a time that was most critical and most pivotal to our existence. It could have been the cashier at Publix and you were a dollar short and about to have to put all those groceries back. And she offered you some change out out of the general thing to help you uh, get your grocery bags and, and keep you from getting back in that line over. It was maybe somebody who was, I know that ain't Jesus, so I can't even. 
Uh, anyway, it could have been any number of people or, or things that served to be uh, a hidden figure in your life that pushed you along the way. Could have been a school teacher who was not getting paid to stay after school with you or, or not getting paid to come to school early to help you, but they wanted to see you graduate or pass to the next level, so they did that extra thing and spent that extra time to make sure that you got where you needed to go. It could have been that police officer who, yeah, they pulled you over, and yeah, they calculated how fast you were going, and probably should have not just taken you to jail, but put you underneath the jail. I'm not, I ain't looking at you, Miss Daisy, but I'm just saying, it, whoever it was, that could have been the hidden figure in your life to help you accomplish your dreams and get exactly where you're supposed to go in the time in which you need it. God puts these hidden figures in our lives and sometimes we call them people sometimes we call them family but I like to look at them as angels on assignment to help us along the way because I believe I just believe everything that my grandmother used to tell me when she used to sing in her house late in the evening hours as I was going to sleep that she would say all day and all night that the angels were watching over me my lord and and, and she would try to explain that in a way to say God just got angels looking out for us. Sometimes our angels look like what we think they all look like and then other times our angels don't look anything like they're supposed to at all. Some of you got an angel out there with a MAGA hat on. I'm trying to, I'm being real with you now. But you don't even know it's going to be looking out for you. Because one day the opportunity is going to come not for them to do the right thing, but for the Lord to show up. And the Lord don't care who he has to use to show up for you. I know I'm preaching here. I'm not going to wait on y'all to get on board. I'm going to just keep on going. The, uh, thank you, Cameron. The, uh, the epilogue to this movie shows that after she, I don't believe this. Watch off. Anyway, um, following the mission in the uh, following the mission of, in, at Apollo of the Apollo Eleven, uh, Catherine Goble Johnson goes on to accomplish a lot of different things for NASA, and she ends up um, getting the computational building named after her um, in 2015 almost 1961, 2015, that is almost, that's well over 50 years, um, she receives these, uh, these rewards. And, and, it, and it really was never a big deal until people started preparing to make a film about her, that things came out. And there's a popular story about these three Hebrew boys that kind of reminds me of that same type of scenario. Because there was a book written called Daniel. Daniel is the author of the, of the book, and most of it highlights the gifts that Daniel possessed, but along the way, he took these three Hebrew boys with him, and um, Daniel got in this scenario where the king wanted him to, uh, he looked for someone to interpret his dreams, and nobody could. He went to all the psychics, they couldn't interpret it. He went to all the astrologers, they couldn't interpret it. He went to all the soothsayers and everybody else to try to interpret his dreams, and because um, None of them, none of the Babylonians could do it. None of the Chaldeans could do it. They thought it couldn't be done. But there were four Hebrew boys, Daniel, uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, uh, who were there. And Daniel said, if you let me talk with my Lord, I'll interpret the dreams for you. And Daniel interpreted the dreams, and they found favor with the king. And Daniel got elevated to be at the king's guard. But these three boys, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they became overseers in the province of Babylon. And everything was good because they did good work and they followed the king's order. But they were painted in such a way, they were described in such a way that it bothered the people who worked for them. Because of the way they were looked at, because of the way that they were thought of, it hurt the hearts of those who were Babylonians to have to work for these three Hebrew boys. It could have been because the Hebrews of that particular day looked like Negroes. They had dark pigmentation, kinky hair, and that sort of a thing. It could have been because 
their people were oppressed and all the folks who looked like them were in bondage or enslaved and had lost their property, finances, and possessions. It could have been because there were so many Chaldeans who conquered them that they thought themselves to be better than that of the Hebrews, but wherever God fixed it, wherever God worked it out, these boys who were looked at and painted with the brush strokes to being less than, they ended up being in charge of the Babylonians. And you would think sometimes that when you go through a lot and that you end up enduring a lot of frustration where you work really hard for something, when you end up making sacrifices to get where you're going, you expect sometimes that people will be happy for you when you get your big break, when you get your big opportunity, when God shows up and delivers on his promises, you would assume that people logically would be happy for you and thrilled that you finally broke through, that you finally got what you've been praying for, or that God finally delivered on his promise. But some of you know better to know that even when you make it through a long struggle, everybody is not going to be happy for you. And, and this is good news to preach about today because some of y'all thought that was just black people's issue, but that's not, that's, not a, that's not delegated to a specific ethnicity. No, everybody in the biblical times have struggled with seeing other folks doing better than them. Church, say amen. It's not just your president's problem, it's everybody's problem. People have a hard time watching you get blessed when they don't feel like they're getting blessed. And so, my brothers and sisters, as it was, they were painted with this picture of being those who were uppity or too good, of those who uh, were arrogant and thought that they did not have to act in accordance uh, with the laws that the other enslaved Chaldeans and Babylonians had to act according to it. And they were waiting for an opportunity, and finally they found it because one day the golden image showed up near where they worked, and the decree and the edict, not yet, not yet, the decree and the edict uh, went forward, <laughs> and, um, and it moved, uh, and it was saying that when the king's music was to play and the golden image was on display, when the pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, uh, the D3, Hammond organ starts playing, whatever, instrument they have starts playing, you have to bow down and worship the golden image. And when this image came out, um, these boys refused to bow. And, and you got to look at not only the fact that they refused to bow, but you got to think about why they refused to bow, because they had already been through enough. They'd already been separated from their home. They'd already been disconnected from their brother Daniel. They had already through the process of numeration had a name change because their original birth name made those around them uncomfortable. You, they didn't forget their names, but they allowed their names to be changed. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were not their real names. But the real names of these boys uh, were Hananiah was the real name of Shadrach. And Hananiah means that God is gracious. But in order to change his identity, they changed his name to Bel excuse me, to Shadrach, which means illuminated by the sun god. Meshach's real name was, was, was Mishael, which means who is like God. And they changed it to Meshach to say who is like Venus. And Azariah was the real name of Abednego, or who y'all prefer to refer to as a bad Negro. I don't know why y'all do that, but, um, but anyway, Azariah means the Lord is my helper. And instead, they changed it to Abednego, which means I'm a worshiper of Nego. All of this, because numeration, as we know, is the process of the meaning of naming someone with a specific meaning. And we always, even if it's just a creative name that we made up ourselves, we, we name people with the intention of people to either have some kind of beauty or purpose attached to their name. You know, when you give your child a name that nobody else is going to be able to read, I mean, excuse me, that nobody else is going to ever have, you give your child a name that no one else is going to have, you do it with the purpose of what? For them to be an individual, for them to be a one of one so that they'll know that there's nobody else like them. There's purpose in numeration. 
When you give them a name with an old name that don't belong on a child, when you name a kid Isaac or Esther or, you know, and, 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 and true enough, it's a beautiful name because that was your grandmother's name. And great. It, you don't take into account that it's going to be hard for somebody in the first grade to be named Elmore or Irwin. You don't account for the fact that it's going to be difficult to be four years old, people calling you Henry. But you do it anyway because that's the tradition that you're attached to and that you're a part of. You understand what I'm trying to say? Numeration has a purpose in our time, in African times. When we came over here and were brought over here in the ship, we were named not for the father, but we were named for the paternal grandparent because that was our custom. And that was usually to extend the life of the paternal grandfather or grandparent for the next generation to know where they came from. And when we got over here and they brought us over to Virginia and Charleston and dropped us off on ships, they began to divide the family. So we started naming our children after the father because we knew that after the baby came, there was a good chance daddy was going to get shipped to another plantation. So in an act of defiance, we then named our children after their father so they would at least know who they belonged to. I hope y'all understand. I'm trying to show y'all names have an important meaning. And if people can take your name from you, they can also take your culture from you. People can take your name from you, they can take your purpose from you. If people can take your name from you, they can take a part of your identity from you. But these three Hebrew boys say, you've already tried to alter our name. You've already taken us from the place that we come from. We've acquiesced to your workload and responsibility. But there are some things that we just cannot do. I can't stand and, uh, excuse me, I can't bow down and worship your God because it was not your God that delivered me up to this point. It was not your God that brought me up to this place of promotion, nor was it your God that has brought me along the way this far. So yes, you can alter what you call me. Yes, you can take me from where I come from, but you cannot make me bow down to your God. It was an act of defiance. It was an open act of defiance. But what ended up happening, the next, uh, what really, you know, kind of brings the, the color to the story, these boys end up being persecuted. And how they were persecuted, uh, it, was, it, was, it was hard to deal with because it was really out of their control. Because they really wanted to get along. But they understood the fear that they had in their God was bigger than the fear that they had of men. I just said something. If we are ever going to truly be faithful to God, our fear has to extend more toward God than it does toward people. But many of us won't worship God the way God desires to be worshipped because we're scared somebody going to look at us and going to say something to us or going to judge us or bring up something out of our past. What's she doing over there making all that noise? I remember when, uh, and, uh, come on now, y'all had to leave me up here by myself. But you ought not be afraid of what some person got to say about your praise. You ought not be afraid of what somebody got to say about your ministry. Why? They don't have a heaven. They don't have a hell. They don't have no place to send for you. But God, but God is the one who sits high and looks low. God is the one that puts food on your table. God is the one that clothes you in your right mind. God is the one that keeps you comfortable underneath the shelter of your home. God is the one that answers prayers and doesn't get patient with and stays patient with you when you do the right thing and won't do the and won't excuse me, do what he's asking you to do. God is the one who ought to be worshipped, but God is also the one who ought to be feared. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, I, 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 I want to do what you want to do, King. I hope God, I hope God allows you to live forever. But we won't bow down. We will not worship your golden idol. We can't do it. And the king got angry because, you know, the, the Chaldeans already done told them that they wouldn't bow down the first time. 
And, and they started whispering and text messaging to the king, you got to do something about this, man. You're going to have a big problem. Everybody else figure out that they ain't got to bow down and worship your golden, your golden image. And so when he brought them to him, he thought that, you know, the getting in the king's presence was going to change their mind. And, you know, he thought if he had the upper hand, if he had the, the intensity of the room and he had the intimidations of outnumbering the boys, that they would acquiesce to his demand. But he found out these guys were, were so uh, convinced of who their God was that they were willing to take a stand. And sometimes, my brothers and sisters, you're going to be persecuted when you decide to take a stand. Taking a stand is not an easy thing to do. Usually when you're taking a stand, it means that you're doing what's not popular. Usually when you're taking a stand, you're doing something that's controversial. Usually when you're taking a stand, you're in the presence of those who think that you ought to be doing what they want you to do instead of doing what God wants you to do. Y'all, I can't hear nobody in here. But sometimes you will be persecuted when you decide to take a stand. And my brothers and sisters, these young Hebrew boys said, we, we got to do what our God tells us to do. And, and I can see now as I read the text, I can see the, the color coming into the words of the book of Daniel in the third chapter because they describe a king who is almost perplexed and shocked that he's not getting his way. Because, you know, kings and people in power are used to getting their way. His, they, they describe his face as contorting because he is so angry and so embarrassed in front of his king's court that he is being denied uh, what his authority is supposed to give him. Uh, the, 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 he's denied the pleasure of getting his own way and so much that his face starts to move around and that, that his, you know, his facial features noticeably display his discomfort. And every now and then, I'll tell you this for free, you got to watch some of the people around you sometimes. Because when you stop doing what people want to do, they may not tell you all the time, but then their face will start to... They start to taking on the posture that they've been sucking on lemons all day. When they find out that you ain't going to do what you want them to do. I know y'all ain't got to say amen right here because y'all probably sitting next to somebody. That it, anyway, but um, y'all understand what I'm trying to... You got to be careful and how you, you know... But, but, but God... But God allowed them to have a discerning heart and discerning mind. And, 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 and so the king said, you know, I know these boys are crazy. These boys are doing really good work. And I'm sure they did not want to lose uh, these boys in leadership. And, and, and so he's like, I'm just going to let y'all think about it for a little second. I'm not even going to get mad right now. I'm going to let you think about it. And y'all play the music. Strike up the band. Tell the mighty elements of earth, wind, and fire to get the music playing. Because I want these boys, I know these fellas. I know these boys are going to do what I asked them to do. They just got to say what they got to say now. But if I play the music, they're going to bow. And, then, and sure enough, they striked up the music. I don't know what song they were playing. If somebody said, body y'all or not. But you understand what I mean. When the music started playing, they refused to bow. The king said, well, I, I done said what I said. I got to do what I got to do. But he was so angry that he wasn't thinking rationally. He said, I want you to cut on that fiery furnace and turn it up seven times hotter than what you've ever turned it up before. I want, you to, I want you to crank it up in such a way that nobody will ever forget in memory what it meant to disobey the king. And the fire was turned up seven times hotter. The mighty men of valor were leading them into the fire. And, and in the king's blunder, he didn't realize that you can't have the fiery furnace up that hot because the same men who led them into the fiery furnace on rope, those mighty men of valor, they got burned up in the flames as well. And, and that's what God will do sometimes when the enemy and the devil playing tricks on you. He end up, you, you just stay faithful. You just do what God tells you to do. He'll end up burning up your enemies first. Somebody missed a shout right there, right there but I'm a, I got to keep on going. But he ends up taking care of the opposition on the way into the fiery furnace. And as they were in that fiery furnace, the king was just so satisfied with himself that he knew that he was getting the job done. He knew he was accomplishing what he set, to, what he set out to accomplish. But over uh, a few minutes, and, you know, that, that cooking time in the fiery furnace, it shouldn't have been that long. You know, he didn't just, he wasn't going low and slow. He was going high and fast. And so it should not have taken that long to incinerate these three boys. He sent somebody to go check on them in that fiery furnace. But don't you know that while they were in the fire, God had already designed a way to protect them in the flames. 
And that's what you got to know. Hold on for a second. You got to know that you are protected when you stand up for God. You got to know that God's got you covered when you take a stand for him. I know some of the things that God asks you to do every now and then seem like they're ridiculous. They seem that they are going to cause certain and imminent problems for you. I know sometimes when you walk out on faith, it seems like you're walking all by yourself. But you need to know that when God sends you somewhere and God tells you to do something, God is already prepared, excuse me, prepared for you to be protected in the midst of the fire. Do I have a witness in here? Somebody went and checked on them in the midst of the flames and they found out that the Hebrew boys would not burn. They found out that the clothes would not be altered. They found out that not a hair on their head would be changed. But what really messed them up, can I tell you what really messed them up? Is that when they looked inside the fire, there were three boys that went in the flames. But when they looked inside the fire, there was a fourth man inside the fire. And it ended up striking the whole conversation. It had to change all over again because the king had to be wondering what kind of magic is this? Or what type of, uh, what type of, of um, magician or psychic or uh, I don't know what's going on. It's some kind of something not right with this equation because I sent three of them in there. And then they got a fourth one in there and nobody is in there burning. <laughs> but can I tell you something? There was some time, there's some point in your life where God put you in the fire. And you may have been looking around wondering how you was going to get out, but you could not see what your natural, what you should have been able to see in the spiritual, is that God always put that fourth man on assignment for us when we are in trouble. God always got a hidden figure waiting for us. He may not show up in a fiery furnace, but God will send a hidden figure over to St. Mary's Hospital. God will send a hidden figure over to your job every now and then. God's got a hidden figure that meets you at the family reunion, that sits next to you at the funeral sometimes, that stands by you in the courthouse every now and then. There are these hidden figures that God puts on assignment to help us when we think that we can't help ourselves. When the load gets too hard for us to carry on our own, when people gang up and outnumber us and tell us what we can and cannot be, God sends a hidden figure out there for us. And I know some of you already jumping to conclusions because you think that, well, you ain't taught me nothing new. You ain't said nothing that I never heard before. But I want you to understand I didn't come to tell you nothing new. I came to remind you of something that you might have forgot. That no matter how hot the fires turn up in your life, God will take care of you. I don't know who's been crying and I don't know who's been hurting. I don't know who's been waiting for a long time for God to turn your situation around. I don't know who's been talked about. I don't know who's been lied on. But if I can't speak for you, I'll just speak for myself. I'm so glad that the Lord will show up and show out for his own. Because I've been through the fire. I've been through the flood. I've been broken into pieces. And I've seen lightning flash from above. But can I give you my testimony? I, I know the Lord will take care of his own. Because even when the lightning flash, even when I was broken, I declare today, God will never put more on you than you can bear. I know for a fact that I should have been dead. I know for a fact that God should have been through with me. I've sinned and I've come short of the glory of God. I've been in places that I didn't have no place being. I've done things that disappointed the Lord but all through my life he never took his hands on me some of the blessings that he gave I know that I didn't deserve but he's been faithful he's been good and he's been kind and because of his goodness I'm still here and as long as I'm here I can't let nobody make me bow down to a God that can't do nothing for me. I can't bow down to money. I can't bow down to position. I can't bow down to popularity. I can't 
can't bow down to what other folks want me to do because the God I serve, I made him a promise. I said, for God I'll live and for God I'll die. Anybody made a promise that you're going to stay on the battlefield? Anybody made a promise that you're going to trust in the Lord? Anybody made a promise that you're going to live for God? I need you to have the, 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 the fortitude this morning huh, to begin to worship the Lord huh, like everything is all right. Huh, I want you to worship the Lord huh, like it's not a care in the world. Huh, I need you to worship the Lord huh, like you're not scared to open up a bill. Huh, I need you to worship the Lord huh, like he's already answered your prayers. Huh, I need you to worship the Lord huh, like he's going to take care of your family. Huh, I need you to worship the Lord like his promise can be depended on like the Lord will keep his word is there anybody in here that knows the Lord will make a way I can't tell because some of you got a scared praise but if you're not scared lift up your voice and cry glory because he's worthy somebody shout hallelujah because he's worthy the king said what's in the fire who's in the fire bring them out of the fire I've got to know who can keep men from burning I've got to know who can spare the lives of the Hebrews I've got to know why they haven't died yet but when they went to bring four out of the fire I heard only three showed up Shadrach Meshach and Abednego and the king said what happened to the fourth man they said I don't know but I came to tell you that there's none beside our God there's nobody greater than our God and the question, if you read the Bible, is never answered. What happened to the man that was in the fire? But I want to offer a suggestion today that there is a place where that man does exist. He may not be in the furnace. He may not be in the problems. But I declare that man is still in the fire. He's waiting for you to be in trouble. Huh? He's waiting huh, for you to call his name. Huh? And they don't say huh, whether it's an angel huh, or whether it's Jesus. Huh? But I believe huh, there's somebody in the fire huh, that's able huh, to bring you out. Huh? There's somebody huh, that'll get in the fire huh, when everybody turned their backs. Huh? Because I heard, huh, I said I heard huh, that there was of fire huh? all over the world. Huh? The books closed up for 400 years. Huh? There was no word from heaven. Huh? We couldn't pray huh? because our prayers weren't being answered. Huh? There was a fire huh? going on in the world. Huh? Couldn't nobody change it. Huh? But one man huh? stepped through 40 and two generations. Huh? One man huh? walked the streets of glory. Huh? One man huh? gave sight to the blind. Huh? Unstopped the ears of the deaf. Huh? One man huh? fed those who were hungry uh, told the dead to take off the grave clothes. Uh, one man, uh, y'all don't know who I'm talking about, uh, but there was one man uh, that told the winds and the waves to be still. Uh, that same man, uh, when the world was on fire, uh, got on a cross uh, on a hill called Calvary, uh, and he stayed there uh, all night Friday night. Uh, y'all don't know who I'm talking about, uh, but that same man stayed on the cross all day Saturday and all night while he laid in a borrowed tomb he died I said he died good God from Zion but when we were in the fire he said you got to come on out so early on a Sunday morning like this he got up he got up I can't 
can't get no help this morning. But I want you to know he got up with all power. All power. All power in his hands. And because he lives, I don't have a hidden figure. But I've got a present help in the time of trouble. I don't have a hidden figure. But I got an all-time God. Do I have a witness in here? Anybody got somebody that's standing in the gap for you? Anybody got somebody that wipes tears from your eyes? Anybody got somebody that's bread when you're hungry, water when you're thirsty? Anybody got somebody that's a way out of no way? Go ahead and call his name. Call his name. Call his name. You don't know the name. His name is Jesus. My lily of the valley, my bright and morning star, y'all got to excuse me, but when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, it don't matter how many people came to church this morning, it don't matter how many people in the choir stand, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul, my my soul shouts hallelujah and I thank God for saving me. You don't know. You were not there. You were not. You don't know when and you don't know where. You don't know what the Lord has done for me. Say yeah. Everybody standing on your feet this morning. <laughs> I thank the Lord. I thank the Lord for saving me. Am I? I can't be. I can't be the only one. I can't be the only one that God had to reach down to come pick up. Uh, some of us, He had to reach way. I'm talking about, I, I ain't going to fall over, y'all. But he had to reach way down. For some of us, just to be where we are right now. And we're not finished. We're not perfect. But God keeps on making a way for us. Despite our condition, in spite of what we have and what we don't have, God refuses to be a hidden figure in our lives. But he's a very present help in the time of trouble. So, like I said earlier, I don't know who this is for today, but that word, I hope, it speaks to somebody that's going through somebody right now. You're in your furnace. But when you come out of your furnace, you're not even going to smell like smoke. When you come out of this furnace, child, you gonna think they gonna they ain't gonna say it was a fourth man in there. They gonna say it was a hairdresser in that furnace. Huh. Look better than what you did coming out when you went in. Somebody ought to praise God for that right now, because I want you to receive that today. God's gonna take care of you, and He's gonna protect you. Even if the enemy tried to say that he would. Today I open up the doors of the church. You're here today and God's purposed in your heart that you would come unite yourself with church family. Ain't no chapel like Pain Chapel. But if you're here for prayer, you need the Lord, you need to speak to the Lord, you need to make solicitation to the Lord, and you want pastor's assistance in those prayers. And Meet me here at this altar today, and I will pray with you and pray for you that the Lord will see you through. If you're here today and you just don't know what you need or what you ask, but you know you want to change what you're going through right now, why don't you just come and just make yourself available? Because if you take one step toward him, I guarantee you he'll take two toward you.
daughters of Emotika. You'll touch hands with someone close to you. Father God, right now in the name of Jesus, we ask for your continued protection, your hedge of protection to be all around your children, God. That you see us safely from destination to destination, God. That you cover us in joy, peace, God. That you will bless us, God, to go through dangers seen and unseen, knowing that it's you, God, who made a way for us, that you are our protector and our deliverer. And right now we say thank you for every good and perfect thing in our life, for every trial and a tribulation that you've assigned to us. We say thank you because even though every day hadn't been a good day, you've allowed us to continue to move forward. And we know that our next day will be our best day. And that the best is not behind us, but the best is in front of us. For in Jesus, we declare today, the best is yet to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody in here ought to say amen. Amen, amen. and amen. Come on, put those blessed hands together. Let's give God some praise today. Amen. Amen. And amen. All right, so oh, we've heard a word from the Lord. Now it is time to continue to worship as we worship in our giving. You can't beat God at his giving. I know I'm preaching now. Ain't nobody said amen, but I know I'm preaching now. You can't beat God at his giving, no matter what it is that you do. The more that you give to God, the more he'll surely give back to you. If you are um, worshiping with us and you don't have the credit 
card or a debit card, or if you do have a credit card or debit card, you see Brother Bell to my left or to your right. Um, but then if you don't have those things, you can download the Tively app to your phone and look up Payne Chapel, and you can give using your um, information via the phone. So um, I hope whatever you need to do, that you'll give and just give your best gift. And as we prepare to give, the Givers Creed should appear before us on the screen. Um, <coughs> this is my seed. It shall meet all my need. I give it today because I obey my God and his command. My tithe is out of obedience. My offering is my sacrifice. My return shall be magnified because I've learned to give right. I'm the head and not the tail, a lender and not a borrower. I'm on top and not the bottom. Because I give, I am blessed in the city and in the field. I'm blessed because I give my God my best. Today and every day, I am blessed. See, I didn't need no help today, but y'all saw it. <laughs> That's <laughs> I said, well, dog, he's going to pop up right when I'm finished. <laughs> Thank you, Sound Team. I appreciate you, media team. You're doing a great job up there today. That's my man, Dontavious, up there working the um, Sound Team. He did a great Y'all give him a hand. He's done a great job today. Um, all right, so these strikingly handsome gentlemen over, look at these fellas, man. But they be hooking it up for y'all. Y'all don't even notice how they, Sunday, to, for Sunday to fourth Sunday, they just hooking it up every week. Praise God for these brothers. But they're going to come help us to worship in the benevolent offering. And um, that's the first opportunity to give. And the second one, we bring our tithes and our offerings to the table uh, during the public offering. Come now, choir sing as we prepare to give. I'm chasing after you no matter what I have to do, cause I need you more and more. I'm chasing after you, no matter what I have to do, cause I need you more and more. I'm chasing after, I'm chasing after you, no matter what I have to do, cause I need you. More and more, I'm chasing after you, no matter what I have to do, cause I need you more and more, more and more, more and more, more. prepared for the public offering as the table is uh, being moved in place. Just lift up that offering as we pray over it. Father God, we thank you for this gift. Use your cell phone to gift. Lift up that cell phone. Thank you for this gift. Thank you for the ability to give it. Now multiply it for the purpose in which it's being collected. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask that you will come now from wherever you are and bring that gift toward the table as we give in this public offering. Y'all, come on, let's give. Say more and more, more and more. Say more and more, more, more and more. More and more, more and more. I'm 
chasing after you, Jesus. I'm praising my way through just to be closer to you. I'm chasing after you. I'm chasing after you. I'm praising, I'm praising my way through just to be close, just to be closer to you. I'm chasing after you. Let us all stand. Father God, we thank you for these gifts and for the hand of every giver. We ask that you would restore them fourfold for the sacrifice that they have made. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All things come to you, O Lord. And a dino have we given thee. Everybody sang. Thank you so much for your generosity and for your gifts. So please, sir, please, ma'am, keep in mind, um, we will not be on the phone tomorrow. We won't be on the phone, and we will not meet Wednesday night here in the sanctuary. Um, but we will Thursdays. We'll have our last Soul Food Thursday for the summer, and then we're going to pick it back up first thing in September. Church, say amen. So y'all want y'all to come. Now, I don't know what was on the menu because I missed last Thursday. But if, if you miss if, if you miss me, you probably didn't miss that lunch. That lunch I don't know what they had for lunch. But I'm going to tell you what they had. The, can I tell you what they had the Thursday before last? They had an open face brisket sandwich. And it was real brisket too. I wasn't none of that, you know. <laughs> I mean, that was it was good, tender, good on the teeth brisket. So everybody brisket not good on the teeth, but this was this was good on the teeth. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Good brisket. And it was a I mean and it was a, a seasoned potatoes with it and a and a homemade coleslaw. Soul food Thursday, you can't beat it. Now this is the last one. So I'm almost certain Michael gonna pull out all the stops Thursday. You don't want to miss it. Because I'm a, if, if you do miss it, I'm going to miss you. But I am going to take an extra play home. If you do not come. Save me from this. I don't know if y'all know this, but Pastor lost two, three pounds this week. Because I'm trying to work it out so I can stay in some of these clothes. Y'all don't want to pay for no new suits. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm trying to, well, I'm try, I'm trying to work it out. Soul Foods Thursday is the only, that's my, that's my place where I, you know, I let the, I take my hand off the wheel a little bit, the Soul Food Thursday, but it's good nutrition, good nutritious food, but more so than the food, it's a good time to fellowship with each other, amen, sit down and eat with one another, enjoy a good hot meal, so this is the last one before the end of the summer, and we'll pick it back up in September, I don't know what the menu holds for us, but I declare it's going to be good, it's been good every week. I mean, from the hot fish to the ribs. Uh, Sister Wilson, what y'all what y'all ate last week? She don't remember. That's fine, huh? Y'all had chicken, baked. Oh, they had baked chicken, and it was some probably some good baked. See, I'm telling you, ain't no telling what's gonna be on that menu. So y'all need to come, and it's gonna be a good time, and we're gonna have a free word at 11:30, and we'll eat at 12:30. Amen. So that's Thursday, and um. I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to put in the first Sunday program where your pastor is. So y'all call me. I'll pick up the phone. Text me, and you and I definitely know who, who some of y'all are because some of y'all ain't called me before, so I don't, I don't have your number stored in, but I want to lock it in. Um, so just text me if you don't get me the first time. But I'm going to be wherever I got to be, I get to you. Amen? But that schedule is going to be rigorous from June, from the end of June, July and August, I'm, I'm 
I don't know. I'm, I'm just, this is my season. The Lord doing a new thing in me. He's, he's, you know, he's giving me exposures I never had before. But I, want, so I don't want to, I don't want to, to neglect you all because you come first to me. You're my first ministry here at Payne Chapel. So I want you to know that I'm available to you. And if you can't get me, just call me or call the office. Call the office first because we, we, we pay the secretary. But that's what, so, you know, as long as she, y'all call her. But if you can't get her, come straight to me, okay? Amen? Our hearts and minds clear. Let us stand as we prepare to leave this place and not the presence of the Lord. God has spoken. Uh, let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. One voice, let the church say. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. So let the church say amen. Everybody with one voice, let the church say it. want to say this really quick if we could just before we receive the benediction I just want to extend a hand of consolation to our brother Johnny McKenzie um, he lost his sister this week he is the husband of Barbara uh, Standifer McKenzie or just McKenzie I don't know what you understand. anyway you understand what I'm trying to say we with you brother we praying for you we know that God there's no hurt that we could have that God can't heal now and also uh, praying for me and my extended family for the AME Church has had a great loss this week. The pro tem of all presiding elders in the AME Church, I know y'all didn't even know that was a position, but the pro tem of all presiding elders, Reverend A.B. Tyson uh, of Chicago, Illinois, he was a presiding elder in the Chicago district. He passed away, um, massive heart attack out of nowhere on Thursday morning. And uh, he was a great, it's a great loss to the church, a great loss to me. He was an uncle to me. He stayed in my house on a regular basis when he would come preach for my father and brought me to Chicago on several occasions to minister. And so uh, all of the whole church is in a mourning right now over the loss of Reverend Tyson. And so we want you to pray for him and his family right now in this hour. So let us look to heaven as we receive our benediction now to him that is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless now in front of his countenance with exceedingly glad joy. Now may mercy, grace, and truth from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. May he rest, rule, and abide with you now, henceforth and forevermore. The people of God say, God has spoken, so let the church say amen. Have a blessed week.